Now tonight we are uh, speaking or studying, I should say, chapter 5 uh, in Catholicism for Dummies, worshiping Catholic style. And uh, I think this will be a relatively short class tonight because much of it we already covered when I had the tour of the church and showed you, you know, the various uh, elements of our church building and what we use in our Catholic rituals in our Catholic uh, life. And by now, for those of you who are attending Mass on a regular basis, you know that our Catholic worship is very ritualistic and ancient. In fact, I would say that many elements of our worship uh, even predate Catholicism, uh, go back to the time, uh, goes back to the time of Judaism. In fact, if you look at the liturgy of the word of the Catholic Mass, you know, where we have the opening prayer after the procession, and then we listen to scripture readings, and then there's a sermon. That's very much based upon a synagogue service that Jews experience uh, even to this very day. Now, of course, they don't have New Testament readings, they don't have the gospel, but they have the reading of the Torah and its explanation, and prayers surrounding that, singing of psalms, as we do. So the first part of the Mass is actually older than the Catholic Church. It goes back to the synagogue services of Judaism. It's funny, Father um, Ben Dallas, who was the associate pastor here, had a, a, a double wedding, which I've never had in my 30 years of, of priesthood, where um, two of his sisters got married at the same ceremony at our cathedral in Savannah. And one of his sisters is, works uh, in the film industry in California, and she had invited uh, a huge number of her friends from California to attend the wedding in Savannah. And many of them were of the Jewish faith. And then one of the other sisters had a lot of uh, Protestant friends uh, who came to the, the Catholic wedding. And he said what was interesting is that many of the Baptist and, and more fundamentalist Christians kind of felt more uncomfortable in the Catholic wedding celebration and participating in it than the Jews did. The Jews felt more at home uh, because they, they, they could see, especially in the Liturgy of the Word, uh, um, a striking similarity between how they would worship in their synagogue service and how Catholics worship. And he thought, how odd that the Jews present felt more at home in Catholic worship than uh, Christians of the Protestant denominations. And that kind of uh, uh, is an interesting fact. The point of all of this is that our Catholic worship is ancient. And the Mass itself obviously goes all the way back to the time of Jesus and the, the, the Last Supper, uh, which was based upon a Jewish Passover meal. Uh, and then the form of the Mass developed certainly over the years uh, and over the centuries. In the first three centuries, the Church was basically worshiping in catacombs, so the Mass was relatively simple. Once we were liberated by Constantine and the establishment of Christianity as the state religion of the Roman Empire, we took over the great basilicas, the pagan basilicas, and transformed them into uh, Christian places of worship. In a sense, we can say we baptized pagan facilities in order to have Catholic Mass there. And one of the most famous pagan facilities where Mass is still offered is uh, in Rome, and it's a tourist attraction, and it has one of the largest domes in the world with a, a, an opening to the sky in the dome. Does anybody know what building that is that is a former pagan temple? The Pantheon. And if you go in the Pantheon, there is a Roman Catholic altar there, and Mass is not celebrated every Sunday on it, but occasionally it is. And... Um, I, I can't remember which feast day it is, but uh, there's a feast day that marks um, something concerning the Blessed Virgin Mary, and they drop rose petals from the opening in the dome uh, down into the, 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 the huge space of the Pantheon, and it's just a spectacular thing. You, if you Google rose petals dropping from the ceiling of the Pantheon, you'll get a video, a YouTube video of it. It's rather spectacular to see. But anyway, that tells you that once the church came out of the catacombs, it started borrowing the ceremonies of, of the pagan culture and of the court, uh, incense and all the rest of that, and the Catholic worship started to accelerate in its solemnity and complexity and beauty, especially when you had large spaces in which to worship 
and the church began to borrow the music of the age, which was chant because they didn't have instrumental music, and applied some of that and some of the chantings of the Jewish uh, synagogue to Catholic worship. So we live in a created material world. We are both body and soul. Um, and we are also called to recognize that which is invisible, the spiritual world, and that both the body and the spiritual are holy, and God is redeeming both. So in Catholic worship, we don't mind using the elements of the earth, even borrowing from Jewish and pagan customs and then baptizing those in order to offer our worship to the one true God. But we're very careful in how we do that, and we make sure that what we do borrow is compatible with Christian uh, sent uh, sensibilities and, and belief. Now, as last week, I talked about some of the heresies in the Catholic Church in the first couple of centuries. And one of the big heresies was um, Manichaeism, which was based upon dualism. Manichaeism was a non-Christian uh, philosophy that was brought, brought into Christianity that said people should despise their physical being, their body, and the material world and see that as dark and evil and of the devil, and that the devil was kind of a god in and of himself, and that the spiritual was that which was unseen or invisible, that which was ethereal uh, and detached from the material beings of the world and your own physical body. The Catholic Church rejected that very early on and said that that is a heresy that we are redeemed body and spirit, body and soul, and the world uh, is created by God and was created as good, and that uh, in the second coming of Christ all will be transformed, and that the devil is a subject to Christ uh, and created by God, an angel that chose to use his free will to definitively and forever be opposed to God, to be at war at God. But that shows that God is in a, on a different level than, than a, a fallen angel, that the fallen angel, in fact, is a creature of God and not uh, a, a competing God in no way whatsoever. So we use our body and our soul to worship God through uh, the physical body of the risen Lord. Now, in the Catholic Church, we have what are called rites, R-I-T-E-S. These are what is, what is prescribed for the various celebrations of worship that we have. So if I baptize a baby on any given Saturday, I have a book I follow and an order of worship, and it's very clear. And this order of worship is consistent throughout the Catholic world although it may be in different languages. Here in America, we use English predominantly. We could use Spanish, which is spoken uh, in the city of Macon as well. Or if people wanted a Latin celebration of the ritual of, of um, baptism, they could ask for that, and we could offer it. But the order of the service is the same. The same thing is true of the order of Mass. It's the same throughout the world, uh, the rite of Mass. And we're going to, at the end of this class, go specifically through the rite of Mass and how to use these missalettes that you have in the pews on Sunday. Um, the same is true with the order of weddings. And I don't make it up as I go. No priest is supposed to do that. Okay? Uh, now, some priests may uh, manipulate things, uh, but they shouldn't be. Uh, we're required by the church to follow the, the, the rules of the rite. And in some places it says the priest can say this or similar words. So there is some flexibility, but the order of the service is pretty clear. Uh, so the rites are the necessary words, actions, and gestures of a religious ceremony based upon the books that the church prescribes for these ceremonies and the various formats and gestures that are contained therein. The ritual is how we do the baptism and how we pray, how we might lay our hands uh, on somebody that's being confirmed, uh, or how we might anoint somebody. So the ritual of baptism is that the mother normally holds the baby over the baptismal font, and the priest taking a shell, either a real seashell or one that is made of brass that looks like a seashell, dips it in the water, and then is prescribed to dip the, uh, pour the water on the forehead of the child three times, saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That ritual action is what communicates um, the action of Christ washing away the sins, original sin of a baby, actual sins of an adult, 
It ritualizes Christ who embraces the child and makes that child his own and shows that he accepts the child. And it shows also that the Holy Spirit is given to this child to strengthen him or her in her Christian or his Christian pilgrimage. So the ritual action shows forth what we believe in faith that Christ is actually doing. So it's important for us to understand the various rituals of the various sacraments, which I'll get into uh, in a little bit. So under, we need to understand some of the symbols and gestures of, of the Catholic faith. And the biggest one that we have taught you and we hope that you're now becoming familiar with is the sign of the cross where you take your hand and you go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I always, I've always done this wrong uh, and I probably have taught people to do it wrong. I, have, I was corrected last year that when you make the sign of the cross you start on the forehead with, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I always put ended amen on this shoulder. So all my signs of the cross the last uh, 56 years have been incorrect. Uh, and I've taught scores of people the incorrect way to make the sign of the cross. But I watched Pope Benedict make the sign of the cross on TV when he celebrates Mass, and he has a very unusual way of doing it. He'll say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he makes the sign of the cross after he says it. So, uh, so there is a variety of ways. There's no correct uh, way uh, uh, to do it. Now, in the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church, when they make the sign of the cross, they do it opposite, uh, sides opposite. The Eastern Rite and the Orthodox Churches go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And the reason for that is that they are following the priest's gestures when he blesses them, and they follow his hand movement. So try this with me. Follow my hand movement and see that what, and, and see if you don't do it the opposite of way of what you normally would do as a Catholic. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Did you? Uh, and was it backwards? Yeah. But actually, they were. They're doing it correct. Mm -hmm. It's the the Latin rite of the Church that, for some reason, the laity follow what the priest does. Actually, if you if you look at it, you're doing the same thing the priest is doing, rather than receiving the blessing. Uh, you can't change it, but, but you will notice that in the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church, as well as in the Orthodox Churches, they make the sign of the cross differently. And in the Orthodox Churches and in the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church, the priest who blesses always um, holds up two fingers, um, I hope I'm doing this correct, two fingers to represent the two natures of the one divine person of Jesus Christ, human and divine, and then these are held together to represent the Holy Trinity. So the Holy Trinity and the, the, the nature of Christ and the blessing is given this way by the priest. Whereas in the Latin rite, we're rather sloppy about it. We might go like this, we might go like this, we might go like this. No, so, so, so just be aware of that. But the Orthodox have it correct. And it used to be that popes, when they would give blessings, would use this method as well. But Pope Benedict doesn't for some reason, and he's, which is interesting because he's so persnickety about so many other things, but he doesn't on that. He kind of does what most priests do, is they just use an open hand to make the sign of the cross. But anyway, those are just peculiarities in style. Yes? Father McDonald, I have a question. I'm, I'm left-handed, and uh, I know the Catholic Church teaches to use your right hand. Uh, what, you know, are there left-hand friendly... Uh, no. <laughs> In elementary school, you would have been slapped <laughs> if you used your left hand to make the sign of the cross. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> now, there is a little bit of a cultural um, phenomenon at work in terms of the preference for the right hand that has some religious significance. For example, in Italy, a left-handed person is, or when you say left, not left-handed, but if you want to go left, you would say, by sinestra. Now, what does that sound like to you in English? Sinister. Uh, because the left was associated with, with uh, uh, the dark side of life or the evil powers in Italian culture and maybe in some other cultures as well. 
uh, may be influenced by Christian belief that God, that Jesus sits on the right hand of the Father and he uses his right hand to, to offer a blessing. So if I were to use my left hand to offer a blessing, it would be almost a sinister action mocking the true blessing. In fact, uh, uh, not that I'm prejudiced or anything, but uh, <laughs> I was at an Episcopal funeral uh, at the graveside where the, uh, it was a woman Episcopal priest who was concluding the service and she blessed the congregation using her left hand and I'm half Italian and I thought, oh my god, I think I've had a curse put on me. You know what's going on here? I have to go home and uh, take a shower. <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> so it's a cultural thing. Um, I kid to Father Justin who's left handed and I said, well, you're going to hell right away. Uh, <laughs> and I really do think it's been ingrained in me in my Italian background. Um, but anyway, just to be aware of that. But we do, inc now it's interesting, uh, we are becoming more flexible, like when a priest distributes communion, the traditional way is that he would hold the container containing the hosts with his left hand and distribute with his right, even though he may be left-handed. But I have seen priests now who are left-handed do it the way that they feel comfortable doing it. But at one time that would not have been allowed. Um, and I have seen people making the sign of the cross with their left hand, but in Catholic custom, you probably, we would, have, we would teach children, use your right hand to do that. And there's some religious reasoning for that. Well, go ahead. I was just say, like, uh, one thing I've noticed is that my girlfriend and I, like, say blessing over a meal, a lot of times, like, I'm on her, but we have to, if we want to hold hands and bless the meal together, then I'm, I'm naturally going to use my left hand. Right, right. And, and she mentioned that to me, like, to do that. Right, you should use your right hand. <laughs> right, right. Do that. Or you could let go at that point and then it'll yeah. end. <laughs> you know, you don't have to be attached forever. <laughs> okay. Um, but what were you going to say, uh, Cerise? A handshake, you would usually use your right hand. You would teach children to use your right, their right hand. Right. Right, that kind of stuff. But, you know, I'll, I'll shake left-handed if somebody doesn't have a right hand, <laughs> you know, or, or you know, it, it's just, but, but normally you would use a right hand, you know, on that. Okay. All right. Okay, so, so the sign of the cross is what we would call a sacramental. Other sacramentals in the church uh, are, and there are a variety of them, are crucifixes. This is mine that I bought in the seminary in the 1970s. Do you see anything unusual about this crucifix? <laughs> Don't laugh. It's the risen Lord on that, which was, uh, in the Catholic Church, this was kind of popular in the 1970s, and churches started replacing crucifixes that had the, the dead Christ uh, corpus uh, and replaced it with the resurrection cross. And then Pope Benedict, or Pope John Paul II said that in the celebration of Mass, a cross with the corpus of the dead Christ must be present to show forth his sacrifice. And so uh, the trend has been to get rid of these uh, and to replace them with our traditional uh, cross. Now, a crucifix obviously is one that is a cross that has the, the suffering and dead Christ on the cross. Now, we do believe in the resurrection, so a lot of times Protestants will say, well, why do they think Jesus is still on the cross? Well, we don't. Uh, we know that he has uh, suffered, died, and rose again. But the sacrifice on the cross of Good Friday is central to the new covenant in the blood of Christ, so it's an image that's very important to Catholics. Protestants, in general, would not use a crucifix or any image on the cross and just have a, a simple cross. Uh, that reminds them of the sacrifice, but also reminds them that he is risen, that he's no longer on the cross. But Catholics um, prefer a sacramental that has an image of Christ on the cross. So this is just a, a, a modern one, not anymore, but from the 70s. Uh, this is a, a metal crucifix that can be used as a, a, if you wanted to, it's a little bit large, could be put on a string or a chain and worn around your neck. Um, or hung on the wall, but it's a crucifix, but it's made out of metal. You can find crosses made out of gold. You'll find Catholics and other Christians that wear these around their neck to remind them uh, of uh, uh, Christ and being saved in him. Uh, so this is another example of a crucifix. Um, 
The rosary is a sacramental. Uh, we've already talked about this to a, little, to a certain extent. It helps you to count the prayers of the Hail Mary. The feel of it reminds you of prayer. Uh, you can carry it in your pocket. Uh, I had a child at our school ask, can I wear it as jewelry? I said, no, this is something that you pray with. You shouldn't put it around your neck or, or parade it in public. Uh, it should be something that you'd put maybe in a case and keep it in your pocketbook, or you could simply slip it in your pocket. Or if you felt like you did want to wear it, it should be placed under your clothes and not seen. Uh, so it should not be used as jewelry. Now, we do know that uh, celebrities today who are uh, not Catholic or have mock the Catholic faith sometimes will wear these, and I'm not exactly sure why they would wear them as jewelry when they don't believe in the Blessed Virgin Mary or, or praying to her. But anyway, this is a, another sacramental. Another sacramental of the church is what we call icons. These are used mostly um, in the Orthodox and Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church, but in some Latin Rite, our Rite of the Catholic Church, R-I-T-E, uh, you'll find images, flat images, of the saints or of Jesus Christ or some aspect of, of Jesus in sacred scripture. And there's a format to make these, these icons traditionally in the Orthodox and the Eastern Rite of the Church where there's an egg wash that's used, it's blessed, it has to be put on the altar for a few days, dried, and then uh, it's used uh, for, for worship. And in the Orthodox Church, they would see this almost on the same level as we would understand the Blessed Sacrament in the Catholic Church, that, that uh, it's a window to the sacred. And it plays important, an important role in Orthodox and Eastern Rite Catholic Church celebrations of the Eucharist in particular. If you go into the Eastern Orthodox Church down the road, they have a screen that, that basically hides where the altar is. There's a door that'll open, and it's called an iconostasis. And the iconostasis has a number of icons on it, maybe the saint of the church, some aspect of Christ, uh, or the feast that they're celebrating. But it's becoming popular in use in the Catholic Church. Now, in the, I can't tell you which century now, maybe the 7th or 8th century, there was a heresy in the Catholic Church where the Church of the West felt that the Church of the East was worshiping these, and thought it was idolatry, and there was what was called iconoclasm, where they were, went into these churches and stripped them of the icons, destroyed them, and then the church in Rome eventually condemned that, and then uh, uh, so icons were once again popular again in the East, but not as popular or very seldom used in the West or in our right of the Catholic Church. But Catholics are starting to uh, use these. This is Christ the King, correct. I think. Yes, Christ the King. The other sacramentals would be the, the way in which we use our body to pray. We stand uh, for processions and the reading of the gospel. We sit for listening to uh, the other scripture readings, Old Testament epistle readings. Uh, we kneel for the consecration. We either stand or kneel for reception of Holy Communion, depending on the custom of, of the church or the particular liturgy that is uh, being celebrated. We use holy water. When you enter the church, you dip your hand in the holy water, make a sign of the cross, say the, the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to yourself, to recall your baptism. And during Mass, in place of the penitential rite, which we'll talk about in a second, it can be substituted with what is called the rite of sprinkling, where during the Mass, a bucket of water is brought to the priest. He says a prayer blessing over it. He dips a, a, a thing into it that's called an aspergillum, and which pulls up the water. And then he sprinkles the congregation with holy water again to uh, recall one's baptism, and that it's through our baptism that we're invited to participate in the life of Christ, his sacrifice, and to receive Holy Communion. Um, we also use holy water to bless people, objects like rosary beads and people's automobiles. I can bless your office. I can go to your home and bless your home, or a deacon can do that as well. Uh, sometimes we're called to bless factories and, and crops and fields. So there's almost nothing that can't be blessed, and holy water is usually used for that purpose to show forth that Jesus Christ is the living water and whoever comes to him will never thirst. Now what is the difference between a sacrament and a sacramental? 
Sacraments are the rites and ritual of the Catholic Church where God establishes and maintains his loving relationship with us, and there are seven sacraments, which I'll talk about in a second. Sacramentals, on the other hand, are the gestures, prayers, icons, crosses, scapulars, um, the sign of the cross, kneeling, genuflecting, uh, that remind us of God and nourish and sustain our faith. So uh, sometimes uh, that can be a little bit confusing. It was always confusing to me growing up. I understood what the seven sacraments were, but I was never really sure what sacramentals were. I always thought they were physical things, but I would learn later, like the cross or the rosary bead or whatever, or a statue that was blessed or holy water. But then I learned later that, e later that even making the sign of the cross was a sacramental. Even uh, kneeling for prayer was a, sac a sacramental, uh, or genuflecting is a sacramental, which point to Christ but are not the ceremonies of the Catholic Church. Now, we can use the term sacramental to mean the sacraments of the church, like a sacramental celebration. But the problem there is more with our English that we can use the same word to have many different meanings. Uh, so, so sacrament always means the seven sacraments of the church, one of them. Sacramental can mean these other additional things that I talked about, or it could be used as a, um, an adjective to describe one of the uh, aspects of one of the seven sacraments of the church. Does everybody have any question on anything that I've brought up so far? Okay. It is customary for Catholics to have sacramentals in their homes. You know, I think most Protestants will have a Bible, which is a sacramental too. Um, and you can bless your Bible, have it blessed. Uh, you can have holy water in your home. It doesn't have, it's not something that uh, is like the Holy Eucharist that you just, you know, treat in a casual way. You can have holy water in your home and you can uh, bless objects with holy water that you take from the church. In fact, if you go up in our church, you know where the baptismal font is? On the window by that is a container of water that is blessed, uh, and there's a spigot, and if you have a, a, a container, you can get the holy water from the container uh, and bring that home uh, and use that yourself, maybe to sprinkle the house if you feel like something evil is entered into your house or, or to ask for God's protection on you. My father used to sprinkle us when we would go on vacation uh, to ask God's protection on us as we traveled uh, long distances. So he had holy water in the house. Sometimes he had even blessed oil. Uh, now these would not be sacraments that they would, my father was celebrating, but sacramentals, which anybody could uh, celebrate in that regard. Catholics have crucifixes in their house. Uh, they could have um, in their bedrooms, you'll notice many Catholics will have a crucifix over the bed. Uh, they'll have icons, statues of Mary, uh, or, or very nice artwork that is a religious artwork. So I would encourage you in that regard to make your home a place of worship because the home is the um, church in miniature, uh, the family is, and the, the house is a temple of the church in miniature and the holy and sacred place. So the Catholic Church really encourages that. No. A lot of people will have a little holy water font uh, at maybe in their bedroom or in the, the entrance of their house and they keep holy water in it and bless themselves when they come into the house. Uh, and that's very appropriate. Again, it kind of connects the house as your temple, the house of the church and the big church which is uh, our uh, building upstairs or whatever church you worship in. Yes, absolutely. So it's to keep away evil, to repel evil, to keep us in line with, with the holy and in the presence of the holy. But with that said, we should avoid superstition. And sometimes some of these things can lend themselves to superstitious practices. And sometimes you'll find in many other parts of the world where Catholics may not have the uh, same level of education as we might experience here in the United States, where some of our religious practices are corrupted with superstitious elements. And sometimes, like in Haiti and other parts of South America, and maybe even Africa, they will bring into Catholicism some of the pagan practices of their culture, which also corrupts the Catholic faith. 
Uh, yes. This where you said the chicken come in? That kind of stuff. What uh, Santeria is kind of a pagan thing that the Catholics will do, and they have all kinds of Catholic things, and you'll think, well, this is what the Catholic Church is, does, and no, 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 no. This is what Catholics have done to corrupt what the Catholic Church does by pulling in things that are inappropriate. Now, when I talk about superstition and prayer or using a sacramental of the Catholic Church in a superstitious way, superstition tries to manipulate God in order to get what you want, whereas prayer places the person at the disposal of the will of God authentic Christian prayer. So let's say that I start wearing a crucifix because I want to win uh, at the horse races that I've made a bet. And I'm trying to manipulate the situation so that I will be a winner. That's superstition, correct? Okay. But I might wear the cross to the horse races because I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm asking protection on the horses and the riders and the best man win. Uh, you see the difference there? So I'm placing things at the disposal of God's will rather than manipulating God for what I want. Okay, that's what superstition does. And the occult does the same thing too. It manipulates things in order to get what you want. So if you like marry a Saint Joseph. I was going to talk about it, but ask the question. Go ahead. That's, a, that's another good one. That's a good one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And we moved, and he's, you know, he has a place of honor in our house and stuff, but I mean, you know, we didn't. There are some fun things in the Catholic Church that are associated with that, that border on superstition, but are not so um, opposed to the Catholic faith that we shouldn't do it all together. I would say that the custom, you could see that kind of thing as a prayer asking God to assist you. And then removing the statue that's buried upside down <laughs> and placing St. Joseph in a place of honor once your prayer request is granted. There's a little bit of, you know, questionable activity there, but I wouldn't say it's off the deep end, okay? Right, it's buried with the prayer, and, and the prayer, this burying the statue represents the it's almost like lighting a candle, too. I mean, it's the, that could be viewed as superstitious, too, but the candle being lit is a symbol of your prayer. Uh, because you bury him upside down and face him the way you want to go doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get to go that way. Correct, correct. Just the right, right. So, Or you might ask St. Anthony to help you to find some lost keys. It, it works for me all the time. And I, I believe in some cases that he brought it from somewhere else and put it where I found it. I mean, because there's no way that where I found it could have been placed there by anybody but him. So, I mean, it's really, it's kind of bizarre, some of the things. Uh, my mother lost something. She's in her 90s. And, you know, so I finally said some prayer to St. Anthony. And I went into some deep, dark recess of the house. And in some place that my mother never would have put this, it was there, uh, and so, and I found it. And the fact that I even found it was kind of miraculous, but uh, that I went to the place where it was. Uh, so, you know, uh, so I wouldn't get too hyper about it unless there really is some pagan uh, aspect to uh, using sacramentals in an inappropriate way. Using all the senses of the human body to experience God in Catholic worship. We talked about that when we did the tour of the church. First of all, we use our eyes. Our church buildings and the way we celebrate our Mass and the other sacraments of the church are a feast for the eyes, aren't they? Uh, in fact, when we pray in the Catholic Church, we want you to pray with your eyes wide open. Whereas most Protestants will bow their head and close their eyes as soon as a prayer is uttered. In fact, that always happens at weddings because you, weddings and funerals in Catholic churches the, the majority of the congregation, oddly enough, in those situations are oftentimes Protestant here in the South. Uh, and they're coming, obviously, to pray. So I'll start with the sign of the cross. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. And everybody bows their head and closes their eyes. And that's just a custom in the Protestant church. Whereas if you notice on Sunday, most Catholics keep their eyes open and are looking at the priest as he's praying. Uh, because of the sacramental aspect of our prayer being uttered by the priest who represents Christ, who is worshiping the Father in our Mass, the, the priest, the Christ is, as our high priest, and uh, uh, the imagery around us, the, the incense that might be going off at the same time, 
all of that, we, uh, our, our Catholic worship is meant for the eyes and to, to view it. And so we encourage people to pray with their eyes open. The, the, and then in the church, obviously, we, have, we use art, stained glass, mosaics, icons, statues, altars, pulpits or ambos, tabernacles, architecture, all to draw our attention to God and to touch us through the uh, sense of sight. The sense of touch in the sacraments is, is, is especially important. When I baptize the baby and make the sign of the cross on the child's forehead with my thumb, I'll place my head on his head uh, as I pray for deliverance of any evil spirits, because there is a minor exorcism that we do in baptism. Uh, I'll actually pour water over the child's head and the child feels that. Uh, the, uh, then the child is anointed with oil, and again I'm using the sense of touch. Um, and we'll place oil also on the chest of the child. Uh, so there's, there are touches involved uh, in all of our uh, worship as well. Um, the sense of smell with incense or perfumed oil or how the wine itself smells, uh, how the church smells, all of that draws us into God. Sound, spoken word, sung word, uh, musical instruments, uh, taste, how the bread and wine taste. Uh, um, in the old days when we baptized babies, we used to put a little bit of salt on their tongue to remind them of the bitterness of life. Uh, uh, we don't do that any longer, but again, the sense of uh, taste was present in that regard. So we use all the senses, uh, or we try to touch all the senses of the human person in our worship because God is redeeming the entire person, not just a part of us, not just our soul, but our, our entire being. So that leads us to the, yes, I'm sorry. What, the incense that are used in the church, what are they? Uh, what flavors you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Father Justin could t tell you more about that because he's the one that orders it. There's no p requirement. Uh, we use different incenses that have different resins and balsams, and some are used, uh, some are recommended for different seasons, like Christmas and Advent might have a particular smell. And it's really up to the parish to decide, well, this is what we're going to use at Advent and Christmas, and over the years, people are going to associate that smell with Advent and Christmas. And then during Lent, we're going to use a more pungent uh, uh, fragrance, and they're going to associate Lent with that smell. And during ordinary time, we'll have a simpler smelling. Uh, but it's up to the, the priest, the congregation. There's no prescribed rule uh, in, in what you can use. Right, there could be cedar. There's all kinds. And I'm not really sure how they make incense, to be honest with you. But it's, it's uh, different resins produce different smells, different fragrances. Um, incense is optional in the Catholic Church. Uh, it's not required. Whereas in the Eastern Rite of the Church, as well as in Orthodoxy, it is required. So if you have an allergy, uh, the, you're up the creek. Whereas here, uh, uh, we do provide three masses on any given weekend that are incense-free. Uh, but there are two that do use incense. Now, the incense that we purchase says on the label, non-allergenic, okay? So I don't know how that affects with somebody that is, it has an allergy, if it does. Uh, but I know, I, I <coughs> know that in the places that very rarely use incense and where people are not used to it, except for once or twice a year, and that it offends them in the sense that it makes them cough because there's a psychological response. When you see smoke, and you're not used to incense, there's almost a reflex to go ahead and cough. Uh, and so you'll start hearing people cough as soon as the incense comes out. But I think it's more psychological than actually they're being asphyxiated by the smoke. Um, but we have learned from uh, experiments that if I bring out a sensor that has no hot charcoal in it and pretend to put some incense into it, as soon as people see the sensor and see me doing that, they start coughing, even though there's no uh, uh, smoke coming out. So there tells me there's a little bit of a psychological issue there. But anyway, we try to use non-allergenic incense. So the seven uh, sacraments of the church. The first one, of course, is holy baptism. And the symbol that we use, or the sign that we use, that Christ is washing away our sins immersing us into the raging waters of his death on the cross and then pulling us out to save us through his resurrection is water. 
So water has a number of symbols associated with it that point to what Jesus Christ is actually doing in the sacrament. Washing away sins, uh, saving us from the turbulence of drowning in our death, in, in our sins, and uh, rescuing us to eternal life. In Confirmation, which was really technically the next sacrament, not Holy Eucharist, uh, oil, perfumed oil, which is called chrism, blessed by the bishop, is anointed on the uh, person being confirmed, which represents the Holy Spirit seeping into the very soul, the very being, bone marrow of the, of the person being confirmed, uh, strengthening them for service in the church, uh, to be a Christian witness in the world. In Holy Eucharist, it's the bread and wine <coughs> that is blessed, broken, and shared. Now, when you look at, in the Old Testament, in terms of sacrifice, when they were offering animal sacrifices, oftentimes they would kill the animal, obviously, on the, the altar, even in, in Jewish ritual of sacrificing a lamb or some other animal. And then what else would they do after they sacrificed or killed the animal, offering that to God? They would eat it. They would cook it and eat it, right? Uh, in terms of Jesus Christ in the New Covenant being the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of Sacrifice's very being, that He gives up His life for us and, our, and because of our sins, the ritual action of remembering that in Holy Mass is the blessing of the bread, the offering of Christ in the Eucharistic prayer, and then what do we do? We consume of the body and blood, soul and divinity of the Lord, under the form of bread and wine. So there's a, a connection with the Old Testament sacrifice and what Jesus has accomplished once and for all in his sacrifice on the cross. Now Catholic teaching is, teaches, and we'll talk about this in later classes, is that there is only one sacrifice. But every Mass enables us to enter into that one sacrifice because that sacrifice now is a part of eternity. It's not isolated to a particular time 2,000 years ago and to a particular place, Golgotha. It is now a part of eternity, and in every Mass, we enter into that one sacrifice and share in it. And that's why the Mass is so important for us, because that's what renews our participation in the new covenant that Christ has established in his blood. Does everybody understand that? Yes. Well, that's, that is the Protestant retort from a misunderstanding, that they believe that we're re-sacrificing Jesus, we're re-crucifying him on the altar, and as though the one sacrifice 2,000 years ago wasn't enough. We're saying it is enough, and uh, that uh, we're celebrating that one sacrifice because it's part of eternity. So what I'm saying is that the Protestants that ask that question don't have a concept of eternity and don't realize that... Uh, this is no longer a part of any particular time and place. It's available to everybody, all times and all places. Not just to the people 2,000 years ago. Does that make sense? Yeah, the key word is available. Available. But it's the one sacrifice. The same, the one and same sacrifice. Um, I'll answer this uh, after I finish this. The bread and wine, obviously, is the symbol of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, his body broken for us, his blood poured out for us, he who is the bread of life, the wine of life that nourishes and sustains us and gives us joy. In terms of the sacrament of penance, we need ongoing forgiveness because when we're baptized, we are forgiven but not made perfect. So. Uh, when the priest hears confessions, it is Christ himself who hears us and acknowledges our repentance and reconciles us to the church and offers us kind of a, a, a renewed uh, forgiveness from, uh, of baptism. The anointing of the sick points out that we need the healing of our body, mind, and spirit. In holy matrimony, we need a family. The church represents uh, the, the marriage covenant, the love between a husband and wife represents the love of Christ with his bride, which is the church. And, and so marriage is meant to be a sign of that. And then holy orders, that of deacon, priest, and bishop, uh, shows that we need leaders in the image of the apostles to guide the church even in the present. 
I have a question that was delivered here. I don't understand fully why God chose to create a, a human version of himself through Jesus and ultimately crucify him to symbolize the forgiveness of sins for the rest of mankind. Why would he choose the death of Jesus in order to accomplish this? Again, you have to go back to the Old Testament and the covenants that uh, God established with Adam and Eve first. They broke it, didn't they? Uh, and then later with Moses and the people of Israel broke that. Uh, and what in a covenant, God is always looking for people to be faithful to him. He says, I will do this, this, and this for you if you do this, this, and this. But if you don't do this, this, and this, the covenant is broken. He's looking for a faithful people, and he never actually finds any until he sends us the second person of the Blessed Trinity who takes flesh uh, through the Blessed Virgin Mary and becomes man in Jesus Christ. So you have the second person of the Blessed Trinity, one divine person, who in the incarnation takes on our humanity through the Blessed Virgin Mary. But Jesus in the flesh is still one divine person, correct? But with two natures. He uses his human nature to be fully obedient to God. And he uses his human intellect and all that he has come to know about himself and about God through the use of his human intellect that is inspired by his divine nature as well to be faithful to God. So in his human intellect and his human body, he was never unfaithful to God at all, right? Even though he was tempted and probably prayed that this cup would pass me by. But despite that, he persevered. And so, in Jesus Christ, in the New Covenant, God discovers a human being who is faithful to him till the end and is willing to give up his life to save all of humanity, not just the Jews, but everybody. And so what Jesus willingly does is he takes upon himself all the sins of the world, past, present, and to come, all the suffering of the world, past, present, and to come, and I mean everything, every murder, every killing, every sin, every despicable act against God, everything is taken on his human person. And in that period of time from the point that he is made to suffer and crucified until he dies, the only way that he can die is because he has taken upon himself the punishment that we should receive for our breaking of our covenant relationship with God. Does that make sense? Okay. Because he's a divine being. He could not die otherwise because he was sinless. But he chose to take our sins on himself, literally to the very core of his being, in order to, uh, um, his human being, to uh, free us from all of the sins that we commit or will commit and the suffering that these cause uh, until uh, uh, the last person is created and, and, and redeemed. So that's very important in Catholic theology that that is what Jesus has done. He has taken our place and God accepts his sacrifice. He is the sacrificial lamb and through his death and ultimately his resurrection we are saved. It wasn't just a, a brief period of time. This was an eternal uh, from the beginning of creation until the last person is created event uh, where every sin, every suffering, every illness was uh, heaped on the Lord. And I think the movie that captures that probably the, the best is The Passion of the Christ because he is so disfigured when you looked at him on the cross, you thought, oh my God, this really transformed his body, what was uh, uh, occurring to him. Okay? And any questions on any of that? But it's out of love for us uh, that he becomes the scapegoat, if you will. Uh, and God the Father accepts that. And that's what the Mass does. It renews what God has accepted in Christ. And our participation in the Mass is the participation in the New Covenant. Now, coming to the Mass, uh, first of all, I want to go through the order of the Mass rather quickly and then show you how to use this missalette. It's important for you to know the, the order of the Mass and to kind of commit that to memory because uh, that'll help you to understand the format and, and the, the logic of the Mass. So if you look on my sheet that I give you, you know, and I'm talking about a Sunday Mass where we have singing, not a daily Mass where there, there may be less music and a simpler format to the ritual. 
So daily mass is a little bit simpler. It still is the mass and there still is this format. But Sunday Mass is more liberate, uh, elaborate and at two of the Masses you, we use incense. We have a choir or a cantor leading the singing or the music. So the introductory rite begins with the processional hymn. As soon as we stand and begin to sing the processional hymn, that begins the processional rite. The priest processes in, who reverences the altar by genuflection to the tabernacle, goes around and kisses the altar because the altar is a symbol of Christ and the gathered community around Christ. Then he goes to his chair, the singing concludes. He may have incensed the altar during the uh, processional hymn, again to symbolize our prayer rising before God as a pleasing fragrance. Then he begins with the sign of the cross and the greeting. Then he offers some introductory remarks. There is a prescribed thing I can say, I can read it straight from the book, or I can say something in similar words. Uh, sometimes priests go on and on at that point, they shouldn't. They might give uh, an introduction to the readings, um, a prelude to their sermon, and in the meantime they've given you a sermon before they get to the, the part of the Mass that this is meant to point to. So normally, I, I'm very brief, uh, let us call to mind our sins and entrust ourselves to God's mercy. Might have a little bit of silence, and then there's the penitential rite. Now, in the church there are several choices that the priest can pick for the penitential rite, and you'll never know what it is until you hear it. Okay, uh, so if you're looking at your missalette saying, well, which one is he going to use? It's going to confuse you. Okay, so just know that there is going to be one, and you have to, to there's, the, there's one form where you do the confiteor, I confess to Almighty God. And then at the end of the confiteor, the priest offers the absolution, may Almighty God have mercy on us. Then we sing the curie, for the Lord have mercy straight through. Or there's a version of the penitential rite that eliminates the uh, confiteor, and there's a phrase saying, uh, you came to call sinners, Lord have mercy, or Kyrie eleison. You forgive us our sins, Christ have mer mercy, or Christ eleison. You will come again in glory, Lord have mercy, or Kyrie eleison. And then the absolution is said, but then the Kyrie is concluded because you already said it in the part of it, okay? So just know that there are different options and just go with the flow. Then on Sunday, if it's not Advent or Lent, the Gloria is sung or said, normally sung on Sunday. Uh, during Advent and Lent, which are more penitential seasons, the Gloria is omitted. Um, then we, we conclude the introductory rite with what, what is called the opening prayer or the collect, not collect, collect, uh, which brings together that part of the Mass and concludes it, and then we sit down for the Liturgy of the Word. We have the Old Testament reading that is read by a lay person. The responsorial psalm can be read, but normally at St. Joseph's we sing it with a cantor singing the verses, we say the, sing the refrain. The New Testament reading is read, usually in an epistle or the Acts of the Apostles. Then we stand for the Gospel acclamation. Uh, all year long it's an Alleluia, except during the season of Lent where we don't sing or say Alleluia. Another phrase is used. Then we stand for the reading of the gospel, sit for the homily or the sermon, which should be based on the scripture readings, and then we stand for the creed, which could either be sung or said, but here we say it at St. Joseph's, and the intercessions can be either sung or said. We traditionally say it here at St. Joseph's. So that concludes the Liturgy of the Word, which is like the synagogue service, okay? Now, this book, which I'll talk about in a second, will help you with the readings. Some people say it's, it helps them to understand the readings better if they follow along. Others say that they can't understand because of the acoustics in our church what's being said and how maybe one lecture is better than another lecture. You can understand one better than the other. So having it in front of you helps you to know what's being read. So it's up to you to decide. Uh, I prefer if I can hear and understand that I not use one of these. I just listen. And if I know the format of the Mass, uh, then I'll get it. So it's not absolutely necessary that you follow in the mislet, but I'll go through this in a second. Then, after the, the uh, intercessions, we sit, and on Sunday the collection is taken up. The gifts of bread and wine are brought to the altar, and the priest starts the, prep, uh, the offertory prayers, or the prayers of the offering, which are simple prayers that he normally says privately or quietly to himself, but he could say those aloud. But if he's saying them to himself, usually the choir is singing or the cantor or the organist is playing something. But the priest is praying things quietly. Then he concludes that either by incensing the gifts and then finally having the prayer over the gifts which is said aloud or sung aloud. Then we enter into the Eucharistic prayer which starts with the preface dialogue. The Lord be with you or Dominus Vobiscum. 
Ecum spiritu tu, and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts, sursum corda. We have lifted them up to the Lord. Abemos ad dominum. Uh, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Uh, gratias agamus ad dominum deum nostrum. Uh, it is right and just. At justum et, what is it? Uh, dignum. dignum et justum. Um, so the English translation of the Latin that we're using currently uh, is in the hymn book, uh, but it's very, you know, sounds the same to me. And I think the more you, you uh, get used to it, you'll understand it. Eventually, we are going to go back exclusively to English uh, because those parts of the Mass are changing in about a year. And so we've used the Latin, which is accurate. The current English that we use is not accurate. And the new English will be. Uh, so so that, that's coming down the line. And you'll, when we go to the new English Mass, we're going to have to be stuck with the Missalette more so because so much of it's new. But hopefully over the course of time, we'll get used to it. Then the prayer, we kneel for the Eucharistic prayer and the consecration after we sing the Holy Holy or the Sanctus. Priest will invite us to sing the mystery of faith, and then at the end, after he sings through him, with him, and in him, uh, we sing the great Amen. Then we stand for the rite of Holy Communion for the recitation or singing of the Lord's Prayer. Then there's the sign of peace that you may offer, that's optional. Uh, the Lamb of God is sung, the bread is broken and prepared for Holy Communion, the Eucharist, and then people come forward to receive Communion. And then after Communion, there's the concluding rite, and then uh, the, the prayer after Holy Communion, the blessing, uh, the dismissal, and the recessional. So if you have that order in mind, then it, everything will fall in place. Now in terms of um, the missalette, I don't like this missalette, okay? But we provide it uh, because it does help people in many ways. The first part, starting on page four, gives you the order of mass with options that are available for the penitential rite or the rite of sprinkling. Then it goes into the liturgy of the word and just gives you the order of mass. It gives you the actual creed. Uh, the Apostles' Creed is never said here at Sunday Mass, but it is an option for some Masses, but we don't do it. Then it goes into the liturgy of the Eucharist and, and then the actual Eucharistic prayers. Um, but you never know which Eucharistic prayer I'm saying, do you? So you're probably figuring out, trying to figure out which one is he saying? Um, so I'm saying if you can hear and understand me, don't use this, yes. Because there's that many choices, and there's more, actually. And you so, give it like a bad or sign to it more. Uh, right. <laughs> I don't, some priests will say beforehand, but, but we really do prefer people to look and pray with the priest rather than being buried in the book. But at least the, the prayers are written here for you to know what they are and what the choices are. Um, some prayers are used more frequently than other prayers. Prayer 2 is the shortest of all the ones we have. And some priests like to use that one because it's shorter. Prayer 1 and prayer 4 are the longest. Prayer 1 is the oldest in continual use. Um, and was the ex only Eucharistic prayer that we used, was used up until 1968, I think. Uh, so for about a thousand years, prayer 1 was the only Eucharistic prayer. So you didn't, you know, you knew what the priest was going to do because the options were limited. But now we have options galore. And it would be awkward for the priest to say, well, okay, I'm using A today, and right now I'm going to use C and uh, D. That kind of breaks the, the, the flow of the Mass, so, so just be aware of that. So this just gives you a breakdown of the order of the Mass. Then when you get to page um, 26, you begin the readings of the Mass. Now, the first Sunday of Advent is always the beginning of the new liturgical year in the Catholic Church, Okay. So this year, we're almost at the end of the, new, of the liturgical year. We're heading towards Christ the King Sunday. Then the following Sunday, uh, the last Sunday of November, is the first Sunday of Advent, and we begin a new liturgical year, and we'll have new books, okay? And right now, we're in year C. There are three cycles of Scripture readings for Sunday. So as I said, we're concluding now year C, and the first Sunday of Advent, the last Sunday of, this, of November, will go back to year A. So over the course of three years, uh, you'll have entirely different scripture readings on any given Sunday. Whereas up until about 1966 or 67, we used to have only one cycle of readings every year, and every year it was repeated. Now it's every three years things start to repeat. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So right now we're year C, first Sunday of Advent, we'll go back to year A. So, so if you look, this coming Sunday, you'll have to look for it, is going to be the 30th Sunday in ordinary time, and the date for that will be October what? October 24th, right here. Yes, October 24th. Uh, so that's the 30th Sunday, so you have the reading, the responsorial psalm. Now the music that the refrain is, is set to is not usually what Nelda uses in our, she uses a different uh, melody. But the refrain, the words are correct. Um, then you have the 31st Sunday of the year, so on and so forth. And then you'll notice that after Thanksgiving, it's over. This book is dead and gone and we throw it in the trash, okay? And you'll have brand new ones in the uh, pews in time for the first Sunday of Advent, okay? Uh huh. Right, right. Anytime it says ABC, that's not years. Uh, only ABC refers to the cycle for readings, but everything else is not. Yeah. Yeah, that's just options, not, not, yeah, right. So don't get confused on that. Right. Okay. Now for daily Mass, we don't have the reading spelled out, but if you come to a daily Mass, look at what is um, tomorrow going to be? October what? 22nd. So look at October 22nd on page 316. Okay. If you'll notice, on Friday, October 27th, it has an entrance song which is prescribed. In fact, every Sunday Mass has a prescribed entrance song. But on Sunday, we're free to substitute that with a metrical hymn. Okay. But there is a movement in the church to tell us to use the prescribed entrance hymn, which is also known as the introit in Latin, set to a chant mode. But we did not teach Catholics how to chant or to read, to chant things, which we should have 40 years ago, but we didn't. Instead, we went to metrical hymns, which are easier to do, uh, you know, like How Great Thou Art, or uh, Holy God, We Praise Thy Name, or Amazing Grace. So we are free to substitute the official entrance song of the Mass with a metrical hymn, but many people say that that was a mistake. And down the road we may have to go back to uh, doing the official chant. But for daily, it's not, interestingly enough, for Sunday Mass they don't put the official, well they do. If you notice, they do have uh, uh, the entrance song for Sunday Mass, but we don't do it. We do a substitute, okay? But eventually, we're supposed to do the official thing. That's down the road. Okay, so at a daily mass, we would recite this. The congregation would, a lay person would lead them. Then they would do the readings, which are not written out for you. It gives you the psalm so you know what that is. And then the communion song is a hymn that is spoken at a daily mass. Okay? Does anybody have any question on any of this? Now, what I don't like about this book is that there are some missalettes that will give you the opening prayer the prayer over the gifts, and the concluding prayer. This doesn't do that, which I think confuses people. Uh, so in the future, not this coming year, but maybe next year, we'll get a different missalette that's a little bit uh, fuller for people like yourself who are learning and want to know the, the order of the Mass. Now, the, the thing that does change every Sunday is the opening prayer, the prayer over the gifts, and the concluding prayer, the prayer after Holy Communion. That changes every Sunday, but it's prescribed uh, for every church throughout the world. So uh, hopefully... Uh, now you can buy a missile, a hardback or leatherback missile that has all of the prayers that you need. You would just have to learn how to use it. But don't buy one now because the English version is changing and you're wasting your money if you buy a missile with the old translation. So wait until the new translation comes out uh, a year from Advent. So in 2011 the first Sunday of Advent, there should be new books that you can buy and we'll have new missalettes with the new order, not the new order of the Mass, but the new translation. Father, I heard someone say that the missal helped them so much, the missalette rather, to avoid the distractions because you have crying children. Right. Time, right, you can focus, the missalette helps you to focus, and that's certainly fine. fine. If it helps you use it, that's why we have it there. Okay. Any other questions before we go to the, the questions on the table? Yes. 
You have the Magnificat. The Magnificat is like a missalette, and it has everything you need in it, right? Right, yeah, it does. Yeah, it has the opening prayer, the prayer of the gifts. Uh, so you don't have it with you, do you? I don't have a copy. But the Magnificat is something that you subscribe to yourself, and they send it to you, right? Right. And it has everything that you need for, uh, you would just bring it to you with you to Mass if you wanted to, or prepare at home with that. It's, a, it's just it's similar to this, but it's smaller but more complete. And it's a subscription that is sent to you. Now we provide a Magnificat devotional for the seasons of Advent and Lent. Uh, and it has uh, prescription, per, not prescription, subscriptions that uh, you can get uh, for the, the regular Sunday Masses on that. Okay?